This is a work of political and social commentary. The content of this video is not meant for children under the age of 13. Parental discretion is advised. When I write the script for each episode, I try to consider all of the things which are going on in the world. I try to find something interesting for each video. Sometimes that becomes difficult, because I want to find topics which interest more than just me. It becomes even more difficult when there are two or more topics which I consider worth covering, and I can't decide between them. Just such a situation has arisen this week. Everyone is talking about Wu Flu, and of course I have some roasted opinions about it. The stock markets are solidly into correction territory now thanks to the worst week we've experienced since 2008, and I also have some roasted opinions about that. Bernie Sanders looks like the Democratic frontrunner, so I've looked at his policy proposals. More roasted opinions there, I can tell you. Not to mention the fact that I plan to cover the results of the South Carolina primary because of what it will mean for the Democratic Party nomination process. There's at least three videos worth of material there. But by the time I get three videos done and published, two of them will be badly out of date. So, grab a cup of coffee and a pastry and get comfortable, because I'm going to hit all of these topics. It's time for some snacks, snarky comments, and some Sunday morning roasted opinions. Let's start with the Wu flu outbreaks. It has another name, of course, but since I want more than two people to see this video, I'll stick with the alternate name. Many people seem to be badly frightened by this virus, and that's perfectly understandable. After all, we see more reporting on Wu flu every day. It's just a sort of subject about which journalists can easily write and which draws a lot of views, because of fear. Fear is normal when facing a dangerous disease, and Wu flu is a dangerous disease. Still, what causes the first breakdowns in social structures during disease outbreaks like this is usually not the disease itself, but fear of the disease. Fear is a very powerful motivator, and a natural response to a dangerous disease. It is also much more infectious than any virus, since it can be spread worldwide with just a few news reports. We cannot defeat Wu flu with fear, though. Fear will actually make fighting this disease more difficult. Fear will make people stockpile pasta and toilet paper in their homes, clear the store shelves of masks, gloves, and hand sanitizer, and shun going outside. The problem is that staying home when we aren't sick or at risk of getting sick will affect production, transportation, and many other aspects of our economy that need to function as efficiently as possible to get the needed materials to the needed places to treat those who are infected with the disease, to disinfect places that we know to be contaminated with the virus, and to provide what protections are needed to prevent the spread of this virus. To fight that fear, facts are needed. So I've done some research. Johns Hopkins is maintaining their dashboard tracking the spread of the virus, and I've crunched the numbers that they've published. As of about 6 p.m. on February 29th, a total of 86,584 confirmed cases have been diagnosed worldwide. Now, mind you, that's against a world population of 7.8 billion people, meaning that so far roughly one one-thousandth of a percent of the world population has been diagnosed with this disease. Of those infected, the death toll stood at 2,976 at that time. That's roughly 3.4% of those confirmed to have the disease who have died from it. Further, 42,041 have, at the time that I checked, been confirmed to have recovered from the Wu flu infection. That's about 48.5% of the total who have been infected, which means that about 48% of those confirmed cases are still being treated and have not yet recovered from the disease as of the time I checked the dashboard. Those are the numbers, folks, but they don't tell the whole story. There are confirmed infections in 63 countries and one cruise ship, but 37 of those countries have less than 10 confirmed cases. Only 7 of those countries and the hapless cruise ship have 100 or more confirmed cases, and only China 
South Korea, and Italy have confirmed more than a thousand cases in their countries so far. In fact, roughly 92% of all confirmed cases have been in China. In the United States, my home country, there are only 70 confirmed cases so far, and 42 of those are people who were evacuated from the cruise ship back to the States and placed straight into isolation. What's more, at least seven countries who did have confirmed cases now have no active cases of the disease. I know that this virus is a serious problem, and I know that people are dying. But, and I say this knowing that some of you will be infuriated, calm down. The WHO, the CDC, the ECDC, the NHC, and pretty much every other national and international health organization are working diligently to isolate, diagnose, and treat everyone who is suspected of having Wu flu. Many organizations are working in parallel to develop a vaccine, and many others are working to develop antiviral medicines to assist in treating those who are infected. Information is being shared. Coordinated efforts are being made and they are already having an effect. China's rate of infection has slowed even as its rate of recovery has increased. The WHO raised its threat assessment on Wu flu to very high on Friday. In the same conference, though, the Director General of the WHO, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, announced, and I quote, Our greatest enemy right now is not the virus itself. It's fear, rumors, and stigma. Hmm. I figured that one out without half the education that he's got. If you want to do something that will help bring about the end of this outbreak, then look for ways that you can really help. Wringing your hands isn't going to get anything done, and neither is spreading all the panic. Share accurate information with each other. If there hasn't been an infection anywhere close to you, then by all means make preparations, but don't make those preparations your whole life. With Wu flu fears spreading faster than the disease itself, though, the global markets are taking an absolute beating. Investors are human beings and just as susceptible to fear. In fact, just a little fear will create a huge market turndown. The Dow Jones Industrial Average has lost all of its gains for the last 12 months. NASDAQ has given back about half of the gains from the same period. The S&P 500 has lost about 80% of their gains from the last year. Overall, the FTSE 100 has lost about 10% of its market value. DAX has dropped nearly back to where it was a year ago. The Nikkei 225 is below its value a year ago, and so is the Hang Seng Index. Only the Shanghai and Canadian S&P TSX indices seem to be gaining any ground right now. But, and I really do have to ask this, why? Why are the global markets largely panic-selling themselves into correction territory? What has changed about the fundamentals of the publicly traded companies in question? Well, quite a few have announced that they are revising expectations downwards due to supply chain issues. They anticipate that sales will be badly off from forecasts because people who are stockpiling toilet paper and surgical masks aren't as interested in buying electronic gadgets. Shipments of commodities and trade goods are being slowed by governments closing their borders to prevent the spread of the disease. International travel has slowed as well. All of those things affect the flow of products from point of production to the point of purchase, and that causes the prices to drop as inventory stockpiles start to build. Investors don't pile up their money from selling stocks, though. They reinvest that money into other instruments like bonds. That's good news for those who want their governments to have the money they need to deal with Wu flu. But it's bottoming out the yield rates for bonds. Yield curves were already partially inverted. The rush to buy bonds is putting pressure on those yield curves, further inverting them. When the panic subsides and the global economy resumes full production, there are going to be a lot of bargains out there. Stockpiled commodities will mean cheaper prices. Cheaper prices for commodities will mean cheaper product prices. Cheaper product prices will mean conspicuous buying opportunities, and that's just what will happen for trade goods. There will be bargain price stocks, too, and investors will shift away from the bond market's low yields into stocks again. The economy underlying the panic selling is still strong. The faster that Wu flu is contained, the sooner that the markets will recover. As for U.S. presidential elections, the Wu flu outbreak is having some impact. Some people react to crisis by increasing their support for incumbents, and some react by wanting to throw the incumbents out of office. 
which of these two alternatives wins out largely depends on the incumbent and how well they handle the crisis. We've yet to see how President Trump's leadership will actually affect the response to the outbreak. But we've already started to see both sides of the U.S. political equation playing partisan politics during this crisis. Trump asks for billions of dollars to respond to the threat of Wu flu, and the Democratic leaders in Congress announce publicly that he's incompetent, asking for far too little money, and leaving the oversight of the outbreak response in the hands of someone hopelessly ill-equipped to manage it by placing it in Vice President Mike Pence's hands. The Democratic candidates are certainly making political hay while the sun shines, too. For example, Elizabeth Warren has introduced a bill to transfer all border wall money to the Wu flu response. Mike Bloomberg has castigated the president for cuts to the CDC budget. Bernie Sanders flat out mocks President Trump's public statements at press conferences about Wu flu response. And in general, all of the candidates have said that they would handle the crisis better without explaining how they would manage to do that. I've seen some commentary that Bernie's Medicare for All plan would better equip the country to respond to such a crisis. Honestly, I can't see how that's true, but I can see how some people would assume that a public health crisis could foster more support for a nationalized health care system. Bernie plans to nationalize health care just as many other countries have done. The flagship of all nationalized health care services is the United Kingdom's NHS. And believe me when I say that the NHS makes its way into Prime Minister's questions every single Wednesday despite the fact that they have had the NHS for decades. The refrain that there aren't enough doctors, nurses, and facilities is a common issue raised by certain parties. Accident and emergency wait times and patients waiting on gurneys in ambulances lined up in parking lots for hours before treatment is another common statement from those same parties. It leaves me with a sense that even the vaunted National Health Service in Great Britain has solved some problems at the expense of creating others. I don't like hearing about massive wait times for urgent cases, people dying while waiting in ambulances, surgical procedures scheduled weeks or even months out because there aren't enough operating rooms, and all of the other problems which plague even the best national health care systems. And neither does anyone else. Nationalizing health care in the United States would be like putting the VA in charge of health care nationwide. And a third of those veterans who are eligible for free health care from the VA still seek treatment elsewhere, even though they have to pay for it. Not exactly a ringing endorsement for single payer health care in the United States, folks. And that's just one of Bernie's proposals. He has several more, all of which involve at least a trillion dollars in new spending over the next decade, and all of which are paid for with higher taxes. Much higher taxes, in fact. Including taxes which could swiftly cripple the economy and force a lot of wealthy business owners to relocate to other nations. Estimates for Bernie's proposed programs go as high as $50 trillion in cost over the next 10 years. That's in addition to any other budgeted items. And about half the money Bernie plans to spend will come from taxing the wealth of the richest people in the nation. The thing is, as I've said before, that wealth isn't just piles of cash in a bank account. It's stocks, bonds, real estate, and other investments, which would have to be sold to pay Bernie's tax of up to 8% per year. Bernie's own published estimates are that half of the wealth of the top 1% would be transferred to the U.S. government within a 15-year time span. In short, that will absolutely collapse the economy as even major corporations will lose their market value and go bankrupt. The only way to avoid that wealth tax is for those companies and their owners to transfer all of that wealth overseas which means that the jobs at corporate headquarters will also go overseas as companies relocate. It won't work, Bernie. Stop trying to tax away the wealth of the nation to pay for your giveaway promises. It boggles the mind that the Democratic Party hasn't nominated someone else already just to stay away from Bernie. Yet here we are, a day after the South Carolina primaries, and Joe Biden is looking more and more like a patient with dementia. He also looks to be the winner of the South Carolina primary by a large margin, but that doesn't make him the front runner. Bernie Sanders is still looking strong despite the results in South Carolina. Mike Bloomberg still looks like a rich opportunist trying to buy a nomination. 
Elizabeth Warren still looks like a Bernie Sanders wannabe. Amy Klobuchar still looks like an Elizabeth Warren wannabe. Tom Steyer looks like a Mike Bloomberg wannabe. Pete Buttigieg looks like his bounce is done. And Tulsi Gabbard looks like, well, honestly, I can't tell because I haven't really seen her. And as of this recording, the number who have dropped out of the race after the South Carolina primary election is 1. Tom Steyer has decided that finishing third isn't enough to justify spending still more of his money on ads, and unlike Bloomberg, he doesn't have enough to just keep pouring money down a rat hole. Bernie is still the odds-on favorite to win the nomination, though. Biden is still his biggest competition, Bloomberg is still the wild card, and everyone else left is still just taking up space on the debate stage if they qualify to get on the stage at all. Not even roasting Bloomberg every debate is winning them votes, because the rank-and-file Democrats don't care about which candidate has the hottest takes. There's a battle ongoing in the Democratic Party for its heart and soul. It's raging between moderate Democrats who like the system, but not who's running it, and progressive socialists who think that the system doesn't work and want to change everything. Unfortunately for Democrats, after years of running with the orange man bad narrative, more voters are ready to get behind Bernie and progressive socialism. Why? Because criticizing the president, dragging the president's policies into court for judicial review, and yet not enacting any legislation which offers a real alternative to what the president is doing isn't leadership. It's petty squabbling, of the kind which reveals itself in torn-up speeches at the State of the Union. It's that lack of leadership which provides no alternative to the bad orange man, who never lets an opportunity to clap back at his political opponents go by, ever. This week, another six prominent Democrat and two independent elected officials in Mississippi publicly changed party to the GOP. They weren't the first, nor will they be the last, and I think that bodes ill for the Democratic Party going forward. I think that, barring a major screw-up by President Trump, the actions of the Democratic Party leadership right now will virtually guarantee his re-election. The walkaway movement is still happening, folks, and in nearly every case, it's moderate Democrats walking away from their party. Either they are registering as independents or they are joining the GOP outright because the Democratic Party with which they grew up is disappearing into a haze of socialist theory. That's what I think anyway. I'm sure there are some of you who disagree with me and some of you who don't. There are two thumbs to choose from right there. Click one of them to tell me if you agree or disagree. There's a comment section below if you want to explain more about why you agree or if you want to tell me why I'm wrong. There's also a subscribe button. Since you've made it this far into the video, click it and set your notifications to all if you want to see more content like this. Thanks for watching.